The minister has indicated that uh, the positive impacts of a regulated cannabis market outweigh the potential negative impacts and that areas which may be a cause for concern can be mitigated with regulation and proper use of public education. Now, subsequent to the St. Lucia Cannabis Commission's presentation to the Cabinet of Ministers on Monday, June 15, 2020, a key decision was taken to engage in further consultation with key stakeholders and the general public to ensure a more diverse and informed position be formulated ahead of a final decision on the cannabis reform. To date, the Commission has held four virtual consultations themed Cannabis Reform, a Balanced Perspective, and that was held via Zoom with the following key stakeholder groups. Faith-based organizations or religious groups, the National Youth Council and its affiliates, professional civic organizations and NGOs, government departments and agencies and other statutory bodies. The presentations have been hosted and delivered in part by Mr. Michael Gordon QC, the chairman of the commission, Dr. Stephen King, health consultant, Dr. Gilbertha St. Rose, a subject matter expert, and have been quite informative and engaging. And so today, the reach has been broadened with a national consultation, and we expect that it will also be exciting and engaging. Here with us in studio, Mr. Michael Gordon QC, the chairman of the St. Lucia Cannabis Commission, Dr. Stephen King, health consultant, St. Lucia Cannabis Commission, Mrs. Melissa Hippolyte Descartes, who's the economic consultant, St. Lucia Cannabis Commission, Mr. Andre DeCaris, the St. Lucia Cannabis Movement and a member of the St. Lucia Cannabis Commission. The government of St. Lucia is represented in the persons of Mr. Dylan Norbert Inglis, who's the legal officer of the Ministry of Commerce, Ms. Venita Thomas, who is the legal officer at Invest St. Lucia. Let me inform you that we welcome not just your viewership, but also your participation. You will be able to call in when we signal that at the telephone number 468-2162. That's 468-2162. You'll wait for when I will signal the uh, time for calling. And also, as always, please post your questions on our Facebook platform, and I'll be happy to pose those questions to the panel. Let's say good morning to all. Thank you so much for coming in. We will now have the representative of the Ministry of Commerce and the legal officer, Mr. Dylan Norbert Inglis, to give us his remarks. The perception and status of cannabis internationally has been subject to pockets of reassessment and change over the last 10 years. Cognizant of this wind of change and the issues faced by the current regime, the Cabinet of Ministers approved the creation of this Cannabis Commission to assess, examine, and evaluate the status quo and advise, among other things, as to whether there was a need to reform the existing regime. In an effort to ensure that the posture taken on this point was informed by the general population, the Ministry of Commerce, International Trade, Investment, Enterprise Development, and Consumer Affairs, through Invest in Lucia, hosted a number of stakeholder consultations throughout the length and breadth of the island, culminating in this today's national consultation. It is hoped that the viewers and listeners will approach today's proceedings with an open mind and actively participate in today's discussions. On behalf of the Ministry of Commerce, I invite you to listen attentively, digest the information, comment, where necessary, critique, represent yourselves and your interest groups, help in the development of a balanced view on cannabis, and the reform process therefrom, and the decision on where we as a nation and as a people go from here. Thank you. Thank you so much there, Mr. Dylan Norbert. We now invite the legal officer with Invest St. Lucia, Ms. Venita Thomas, for her opening remarks.
Good morning, everyone. I am Vinita Thomas, Legal Officer at Invest St. Lucia, and it, it is my privilege and pleasure to say a few words on behalf of Invest St. Lucia, who was tasked with spearheading this initiative. First, I'd like to offer my heartfelt welcome to all participants in this consultation, whether viewing online or tuned into NTN, and to all the members of the Cannabis Commission who gave their time willingly and offered a range of perspectives on the issue. A special thank you to the panelists who have put in a tremendous amount of work throughout this process. Job well done. About a year ago, Cabinet approved the, the establishment of a commission to review the laws on cannabis and make recommendations on a legislative framework. We were then informed that this was the third or fourth attempt um, at establishing a commission. Though many expressed their skeptic um, skepticism that this time would be no different, Investment Lucia has proven otherwise and sought to ensure the Commission fulfilled its mandate. Investment Lucia acted as a secretariat to the Commission and lent support every step of the way, both financially and administratively. As business enablers, Investment Lucia is here to help. We note the positive impact of a regulated market, but we are equally mindful of the negative impact. We must therefore thoroughly consider all aspects of a regulated industry, including the impact on youth and public health. To this end, we invite the general public to stay tuned as we present our findings and seek your views on the reformation of laws on cannabis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Thomas. And now we get into the meat of the matter. We now say Hello and welcome to Mr. Michael Gordon QC, who is the chairman of the Senusha Cannabis Commission, who will be delivering his presentation to us, giving us an idea of what the commission has been doing, the work of the commission over the last year. Thank you. Good day. The Cannabis Commission, as established by the government of St. Lucia, was really a successor to the Caribbean, the CARICOM Regional Commission on Marijuana, set up by the heads of government under the chairmanship of Professor Rosemary Bell Antoine. That commission was peopled by a plethora of highly qualified and recognized persons. The report, the Antoine report, digs deeply and analytically into the sociology, religious, medical, and criminal aspects of the study of marijuana and the possible effects of legalizing its use in our CARICOM countries. There is no intention, either in our report or on my, or on my part at this time, to regurgitate the very broad and thorough treatment of the subject by the CARICOM Commission. In our report, a draft of which has been submitted to Cabinet, we borrow substantially from the conclusions and recommendations of the CARICOM Commission. We did not attempt to cover the same ground as they did. We accepted their conclusions, which in principle favored the legalizing of cannabis. I need to admit at this point that the report uses two terms, legalizing and decriminalizing. Unfortunately, I have been unable in my own mind to distinguish that there is a difference between the two terms. The St. Lucia Commission felt that they would be best occupied by determining the, re the regulatory environment in which cannabis could be legalized. We accepted, as I said, the conclusions of the CARICOM Commission. 
And to go to the end of our report, our conclusion was as follows. The Commission was of the view that the growing processing for industrial and medicinal purposes, the possession for recreative use by adults, and the possession and use for religious use should be made legal within a framework which we set out. The Commission was of the view that the protection of young persons under the age of 18 should be achieved by the criminalizing of the sale or otherwise supplying or attempting to supply high THC cannabis for recreational use by young persons. Dr. King will speak at some greater length to the importance of protecting the youth. The Commission came up with their view of how the regulated industry should look. And it is a model not dissimilar from that which existed for bananas. In this model, there would be a central purchasing association, well, there would be a St. Lucia Cannabis Cooperative, which would be, which would comprise all the growers of cannabis. Their responsibility would be to license all growers and to determine what criteria should be used by growers in terms of strength, etc. The Cooperative would be the licensing authority and no person could legally grow marijuana with an exception which I'm about to give unless they were licensed by the cooperative. The quality of the marijuana produced could be assessed by the Bureau of Standards, which already exists and has the structure that could be used in that circumstance. I mentioned an exception to licensed growers. There are actually two. The first, and perhaps more important, is the use of cannabis by the Rastafarians. Cannabis is regarded by their religion as a sacrament. And it is of interest to note that late last year, the High Court, which is our High Court, in St. Kitts, handed down a judgment which determined that the criminalizing of marijuana was against the Constitution, against, it violated the rights of freedom of religion. That particular case has not gone on appeal yet, as far as I know, uh, but that is the law that we are bound by now. Finally, it is the view of the Commission that the growing and regulate, sorry, the regulating of cannabis will be a cost element to government and therefore a model needed to be developed which would generate a revenue stream to the government of St. Lucia. A stream which would both finance the regulation and add to the national wealth. Mm -hmm. The economic consultant, Ms. Hippolyte Descartes, and the medical assistance to the commission will be both spoken to by Dr. King as to the medical and Ms. Descartes as to the economic modeling. And that really is all that I have to say.
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Michael Gordon QC. At this time, because I know as the questions will come in, we'll be sure we're engaging you then. So we want to go straight to uh, Dr. Stephen King, who is the health consultant, as the chairman indicated for the Sinusha Cannabis Commission, who will be enlightening us regarding the sort of health matters pertaining to cannabis. Thank Doctor? you. Good morning. Um, the argument that I would like to you to engage in is really three bullet points on the slide that you can see. The criminalize criminalization approach versus a public health approach. Currently, um, cannabis is, all forms of cannabis are prohibited in St. Lucia, therefore illegal, therefore it is a criminal offense to have anything to do with cannabis in St. Lucia. And this is the criminalized approach. The public health approach is twofold. One, the public health approach says you identify your problem, you research your problem, you look for best practices, then you design a strategy to address your problem, you implement it, and then in an iterative way, in a flexible way, you, you modify your, your approach until you've solved your problem to the best of your ability. The other component of the public health approach is that primarily substance use and abuse is essentially a health issue, not a criminal one. Um, in terms of the negative impact, the, of course, cannabis does have negative effects. There are negative effects of cannabis. The, the situation, however, is that in the current prohibited environment, these negative effects are already being felt by uh, us in this country. And when I finish the, going through my slides, I think you'll appreciate the the kinds of reasons why these negative effects are, are even exacerbated under the criminalized prohibitive approach versus uh, a legalized public health approach that we would like to propose. There's another fact, and that is that cannabis has a positive impact. There are benefits to the use of cannabis, medical, sacramental, and indeed personal use. There are benefits, and, and the current um, criminalized environment does not allow us to maximize these positive effects. So we, would, we are proposing a legal regime which would allow us to do so. The cannabis plant, um, and in particular, it is the female of the genus that we are really interested in, because it is the female plant that flowers. And, the, and in the flowers, that is where the cannabinoids are concentrated. In the cannabis um, genus, there are three main species that, that are of interest to us. That is cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruderalis. There are also hybrids, and nowadays there are even more hybrids on the market. In St. Lucia, um, sativa is probably the most common cannabis plant that we have, um, followed possibly by some indica. In terms of the cannabis, um, we have to understand that there are 104 or more cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, is just one. And THC is the one that actually um, the entire law and the entire process, the entire argument is all really about THC because this is the one that has the psychoactive um, effects. There are also in the plant a number of other chemicals, terpenes, which give the plant its characteristic um, smell, lemony or musty or whatever, um, and there are flavonoids. The, the effect of the cannabis plant, medical, sacramental, or for that matter, personal, are often related to the combination of chemicals in a particular plant, which is why the effects of cannabis um, vary from, pl from plant to plant. It's what we call the entourage effect. In other words, you will find that a particular effect, for instance, if you're treating pain with a plant, you may find that um, a particular species with a particular ratio of THC to CBD and to other chemicals will be better than another one with another um, sets of ratios. Mm -hmm. The other thing about the cannabis plant that we have to understand is that um, the THC levels can be as low as less than 0.3% in what we call hemp. Therefore, a product, a cannabis plant called hemp has no psychoactive effect and therefore our particular um, Misuse of Drugs Act, which, which criminalizes hemp, which is really trying, and the, the purpose of that act is to look at THC and control THC, but hemp has essentially negligible THC. Why would hemp be criminalized in, under the current environment? 
So I want people to understand that when we talk about the cannabis plant, we are talking about thousands of different plants. This plant has been in use by the human race for over 6,000 years. In fact, it, it, was, it's been on, it was on the medical pharmacopoeia in the, in the United States until 1942. It was actually taken off because the plant was criminalized between 19, 1916 and 1937 when the Marijuana Tax Act was, was um, put in force. This plant became criminalized and then it was removed from the pharmacopoeia. And a lot of the stigma and discrimination and propaganda associated with this plant really um, started then but was exacerbated in the war on drugs in the Reagan and Nixon era of the 1970s. And the, there's a UN drug report uh, called the War on Drugs, which points out how that war has failed. The next slide shows us, this is a, a, a nice scientific diagram showing you a, a synapse, which is a, which is a space between two um, neurons, which are nerve cells. There's the upper nerve cell and the lower nerve cell. When the upper nerve cell decides, becomes excited and it fires and reduces, re releases chemicals, it excites the, the, the lower nerve cell that you see there. And what happens, when, when, what happens when, when, when that nerve fires? We get the endocannabinoid system being activated. What does that do? The endocannabinoid system is a regulatory system, widespread throughout the body. What that does is it actually slows down. It's like pop-up bricks. It puts the bricks on the, the neuronal activity. It's, in other words, the endocannabinoid system is a protective system in our body. The endocannabinoid system, there are receptors not only in the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, but in the GI tract, that is in your stomach and your intestines, in your bones, in your muscles, in, your, in, in a whole range. Almost every um, part of your body will have a certain amount of cannabinoid receptors. Now the interesting thing about this is that the phytocannabinoids, which are the chemical cannabinoids, act on the very same receptors. They look very similar in their molecular configuration to our own endogenous cannabinoids. And so they act on the very same receptors. What that, what, therefore, you'll understand why cannabinoids tend to have a neuronal stabilization effect. They slow down neuronal activity. They slow down inflammatory activity because they actually act on cells in the immune system to downgrade the immune response, which, which, so, which is why cannab cannabis has an anti-inflammatory effect as well. Mm -hmm. Now the next slide shows us the, the distribution of the receptors in the central nervous system. The interesting thing about this particular slide, if you look at the brain stem, which is that part of the, of the, of the brain that comes off the bottom and, and you can see it going down the neck, that is the, the part of the, of the brain that actually can, has many of the vital centers the centers that control our cardiovascular system, our respiratory system. You will note that they, they, there's no green on this slide in those areas. That is because the brainstem does not have um, a lot of cannabinoid receptors. And this is why cannabis, even at high levels, the overdose of cannabis does not cause death. You don't get death from, from cannabis overdose because the brainstem is not suppressed by cannabis. As compared to drugs like alcohol, or opioids, which, which would affect the brainstem. The other areas that look very green are where we have the cannabinoid receptors. And when you, if you, will, when you look at this slide, you will see, therefore, cannabis affects things like decision making, emotional behavior, cognition, learning, memory, etc. So this is why you see this, the effects that cannabis has in the body in these areas, on these functions. The, the next slide is showing us synaptic development Throughout the, throughout the years. It's a snapshot. Taken as a newborn, you'll see the newborn does not have a lot of synaptic development. In other words, the, the, brain, the neurons have not made connections. The, the brain is like a blank slate at this time. Then you'll note up to nine months and up to two years, you'll start to see more synapses being, being formed. This is the rapid brain development of a, in the first two years of life. The most important years of life in any human being um, life cycle are these first two years because here is when the foundational potential of brain, um, um, your brain activity and therefore in fact your success is, is, is generated. It is why this time of life the children must be maximally stimulated in terms of play and they must be protected from the adverse childhood experiences. Um, you'll notice that in adulthood 
there are less synapses. What happens now throughout the adolescent period, you get pruning of the circuits of the brain because the brain is becoming efficient. The brain becomes efficient based on the context in which the adolescent is growing because what, what nature is trying to do is make this human being maximally adapted to the environment within which the, that, that human being is living. You would appreciate, therefore, a child growing in a troubled, um, violent area will have a different set of, of circuits than a child growing in a peaceful um, 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 area. And that is why, again, the environment is so important. However, how does it relate to cannabis? Well, the endocannabinoid system is crucial in neural development and synaptic um, making and synaptic pruning. Therefore, phytocannabinoids, which are the, can the cannabinoids from the plant, if, they, if a pregnant lady or a child or an adolescent gets exposed, it will alter the synaptic development, both the development and the pruning of, of those circuits in the brain. Whether that has a negative effect or not, we don't know. However, public safety and health safety would say, do not interfere with the natural process if you don't have to. Therefore, that is why our recommendation is you do not expose pregnant women, children, and adolescents to cannabis products unless there's a medical indication. Now, this next slide shows us the prevalence of cannabis use in St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Jamaica, and Trinidad. You will note, again, the current situation. Um, do not believe that because cannabis is illegal, youth are not using cannabis in St. Lucia. That is a myth. And here is a stark reality. Up to a quarter of our, of our, of our youth are using cannabis on a regular basis. You find males slightly more than females. Now, in terms of this slide shows us perceived risk and use. And you see, as there's a perceived less risk, you get more use of a particular substance. In this case, as this slide says, marijuana. By the way, on an aside, we don't like the word marijuana because marijuana is a derogatory term for cannabis. We like the scientific term cannabis. Um, however, the New England Journal has this slide, and therefore the point here to be made is we must be careful in our education programs that we give the real risk, not the, not the uh, we don't glorify and promote cannabis, just like we don't um, propagandize and discriminate and stigmatize cannabis. We give the facts, the truth. We tell the youth the truth. The next slide shows us a wheel, which shows you a number of different cannabinoids and how they all have medical benefits or medical uses. In fact, so much so, you'd appreciate that Big Pharma is actually into the cannabis business now. You'll have Epidiolex, you'll have Canavert, you'll have Asmosol. There are a number of Sativex, there are a number of different um, cannabinoid um, formulations that are on the market right now. So that there's little doubt that cannabis does have a medical um, benefit. Now, some of in the National Academies of Science um, paper in 2017, which explored the, the current status of research and the um, use of um, effects of cannabis, came up with conclusive or substantial evidence and moderate evidence that, that these, this slide shows you the areas where cannabis is, def is known to work, in pain, in inflammation, in sleep, disorders, seizures. There's even a rather interesting syndrome called the endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. And that syndrome is really, they're, 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 it can manifest itself in terms of irritable bowel syndrome, migraines, certain types of migraine syndromes, um, uh, fibromyalgia, and um, post-traumatic stress disorder. All of those, all of those syndromes um, apparently have low endocannabinoid, and hence you'll find that they respond to cannabinoid use as a medicine. In terms of cannabis disorders, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual 5, which is the um, um, version 5, which is the psychiatric Bible um, that, that doctors use, um, identifies the following as, the, as disorders of cannabis, cannabis use disorder. This is, this is a syndrome where, where people chronically use um, cannabis, and they become socially dysfunctional, um, productivity is low, and they spend much of their day um, seeking out um, cannabis. This tends to happen in some um, um, people, 
susceptible people in particular, but also people that are using um, high THC variants in particular on a daily basis. Cannabis intoxication. This is when people um, freak out. It, it more happens, um, interestingly, with edibles. Why? Because when you, if you smoke or inhale or put cannabis under your tongue, an oil or whatever, it will be absorbed more quickly and you'll get a more rapid effect. So within 15 minutes of smoking, somebody begins to feel the effects of cannabis. And within two hours, it wears off. When you eat it, it'll take maybe up to an hour for you to begin to feel the effects. It'll take up to six hours to wear off. So what you tend to find is people tend to overeat cannabis and then begin to freak out for a period of six hours. I tell, I tell people that the iconic intoxicated person in my mind is a young adolescent female in a Sir Arthur Lewis uniform who comes into the emergency room climbing the walls thinking she's going to die because she ate some cake or brownies or whatever at the school um, in, from one of her friends at school. Um, you, do, we, you don't die, but you feel that way. Cannabis has a depersonalization um, 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 effect and a lot of people get very anxious with that depersonalized effect. They feel like they're going crazy. Um, substance abuse. In days gone by, we used to talk about the gateway theory. And we used to, and this was, this got a lot of traction. That, you know, a youth that starts to use um, cannabis will then graduate onto cocaine and then graduate onto heroin as they seek more and more thrills. That's not true. What we speak about now is a common liability theory in that the individual has issues and they get relief from substances. They are seeking escape through substances. And um, in fact, the interesting thing about cannabis in particular and why people with mental health issues from depression to anxiety to psychosis and thought disorders, the reason why people will gravitate towards cannabis, not only is it because it's available easily, but also because of its neuronal amelioration and inhibitory effect. It tends to give people a sense of control over their thoughts. Their thoughts slow down. So they feel they get a benefit from it. And in fact, CBD, cannabidiol, is now being studied as a, as a pharmaceutical product to deal with schizophrenia, anxiety, and so on. THC, it is true, tends to be pro-psychotic. CBD is anti-psychotic. Um, and of course, in an un unregulated environment, when you go on the street because you have thought disorders and you go seeking out a cannabis product to ameliorate your, your, your painful thoughts that are disturbing you greatly, you may find high THC, which might make your problems worse. Um, in terms of the common liability theory, adverse childhood experiences are probably the main underlying factors that produce a, a person that needs to, that has poor coping skills and needs to find substances to relieve their, 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 their problems. Um, what we should be doing, educating people, providing widespread support counseling services, and in our estimation, only a legalized regime can achieve that. Only a legalized regime can regulate products to make sure that, they, that, there's, that there's regular product that does not have high THC, and only a legalized regime will produce revenues to invest in counseling and um, education to protect people and help them with their problems. Um, the, I've just put a slide here showing you some of the adverse effects. I think there may be two to, to highlight that we haven't mentioned. One is motor vehicle accidents. There is no doubt that driving under the influence of cannabis um, can be associated with accidents and therefore in a legalized regime we need to um, address driving under the influence. In terms of bronchitis, there is an association clearly between smoking and bronchitis which is an inflammation of the airways. Um, now the interesting thing, Dr. Lisa Charles, Dr. Chris Nathaniel and Dr. Martin Didier did a retrospective review of, of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in St. Lucia at VH and produced a wonderful paper which actually is backed up by international research, which shows that the mixing of cannabis with tobacco, which is a common practice on the streets in St. Lucia, is very detrimental. What that does, there's a, approximately a 20 year interval between starting use of a mixed cannabis tobacco product and end stage lung disease, and, and of course dying with a, a, of, lung, of lung disease. So what you're finding is um, male, men and women in their 40s 
are dying as they started their smoking in their 20s or their adolescent period. So the message here is quite clear as we've given it, don't mix tobacco and cannabis. The next, um, well, the next dangerous substance is tobacco. Tobacco by itself, within 50 years, will produce end-stage lung disease. Um, cannabis by itself does not seem, at this point in time, by as far as we can tell, does not produce end-stage lung disease, although it can produce um, bronchitis. Um, Dr. Um, Naomi Jean-Baptiste and Naomi de Turville at the Mental Wellness last year, the last six months of last year, pulled out every admission into the Mental Wellness Center and, and gave me this data. The bottom line is there were 568 admissions to the Mental Wellness Center over those six months. 402 were female and 166 were female. 229 reported using cannabis. 172 had a, 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 some mental health disorder and also cannabis use, and 57 or 10 percent had cannabis use only. This, this slide is instructive in two points. One, that cannabis is often associated with other disorders, and as I've said before, to dissect that out, is it the disorder that is driving the cannabis use or the cannabis use driving the disorder? And that can be difficult to dissect. But I think the science is quite clear. People with mental health issues will seek out cannabis, but the cannabis can exacerbate their problems, make it come on faster or make, it, uh, make the cause worse. And, and so I think you can, you can assume that most of that cannabis use under that 172 is not cannabis causing the problem, it's cannabis together with the problem. Cannabis use only 57%, so 10%. So it does happen. We are seeing it, and we've got to be cognizant of that. In the, in the literature, Again, high THC and chronic use is what is associated with psychosis. In addition, host factors, people with a particular genetic makeup, the, the, the CRMT gene and the AKT1 gene, which are genes that program neurotransmitters in your brain, there are certain people with certain formulations of those um, genes that, are, that tend to be the ones that are susceptible to getting what we call ganja psychosis, cannabis-induced psychosis. So it's not everybody. Um, this slide just shows, shows us the other problem in our current regime with, from a health point of view. In a whole, if you look at health holistically, this shows you penalties for offense of, of handling cannabis in any form or fashion. And as you can see, incarceration is there. What does that do? First of all, Mr. Michael Gordon very eloquently mentioned Rastafari. Rastafari is a recognized religion in St. Lucia, and as such, their, their cannabis, which is a sacrament, is, is their legal right, their constitutional right. It is their human right. We have used this particular law, puts them in conflict with this law. Their sacramental use, their human right, is in conflict with our law. This has, this has produced or perpetuated much injustice against the Rastafarian faith. Many of them have been incarcerated, in, and in our view, unfairly so, and in the view of the court, the high court in St. Kitts, I think it was, that unfairly so. Mr. Gordon probably correct me and say the high court in St. Kitts is the OECS high court, but um, fair enough. <laughs> but there it is. The other population that has been so hurt by this law are youth. You incarcerate a youth, you actually end up really hurting that youth. Because that stigma of being incarcerated, whether on remand or convicted, is going to hurt that youth for the rest of that youth's life. It alters the trajectory of the success of the youth. Therefore, this law, in our view, is hurting both youth and Rastafarians in particular. And by extension, all of us. Because injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. Um, here now is interesting. If you look at this slide, from 2014 to 2018, you will note cannabis-related arrests to total arrests, the percentage, are dropping from, in 2014, 11% to 2018, 1.6%. What's happening here? Law enforcement is finding it more and more morally incompatible with their, with their ethic to, to, to enforce this law. One, it is almost difficult to enforce it because the actual drug report says there's a prevalence of 11% of solutions that are using cannabis in a, um, in, a, in a continuous way. You cannot incarcerate all these people. And law enforcement is actually beginning de facto decriminalizing 
and cannabis. And of course, this, this puts them in conflict with the law, unfortunately. Therefore, the law must change. Here is a slide which just merely shows you, in case you thought that people were still not being incarcerated for cannabis-related offenses in 2018, 26 people were admitted. And I think yesterday Mr. Gordon pointed out to us that there are 35 um, people right now in Borderley. About 7% of the Borderley population are there for cannabis-related offenses. So, as we wind down, I would like to propose to you, as we have proposed to the government, that the policy objective should be to increase government revenues, to create business opportunities in a country that has high unemployment and low revenues to many households, minimize the harmful effects of cannabis, improve the health and wellness of people, and of course respect human rights. This particular slide is taken from UK Transform or Transform UK and it talks about this and many times we go on consultations and I want to tell you up front, alcohol needs to be better enforced and controlled in our and better regulated in our country. We have laws that are not being enforced, they need to be so. And what this slide points out to you is strict legal regulation is the best possible approach to minimizing social and health problems of any substance. Alcohol, cannabis, tobacco, anyone. And the two worst regimes are the current regime we have of the unregulated criminal market where you've prohibited and you have an underground economy where revenues are going to the underground and, and government is spending money to enforce a regime that cannot be enforced in a, in a just manner. And the other regime, or the other side of the curve, the unregulated legal market, free the weed, commercial, smoke everywhere, um, everybody, that is not the way to go either, because that is also a harmful um, regime. So we are proposing the middle regime, which is strict legal regulation in an in a obviously legalized environment. So my last two slides, I believe, science to policy, what we must do from a scientific point of view. Hemp is, should be um, freely available and legal from now. There's no THC in hemp. And hemp has great industrial uses as well as medical um, um, uses. Um, public education, public education and public education. One-on-one, -on -one, um, mass media, we need uh, to be an educated po populace with regards to cannabis. The public health approach I've told you about already. Medical cannabis I've told you about already. And research. Let us do our own research and understand this substance in our society, in our culture. And the science to policy, the nose. High potency THC products. Now you'd appreciate in an unregulated criminal regime, we cannot regulate the THC products on the market, in the streets. However, in a legal regime, we can. We can um, regulate. And Mr. Gordon spoke to that. No um, cannabis to pregnant and breastfeeding women. No cannabis to children under the age of 18. Zero criminalized, well, no criminalization across the board. As Mr. Gordon said, especially only in the circumstances of underage use. No public smoking. Let us have regulation of public smoking as we do for tobacco. People with psychosis, a family history of psychosis, warning. Be careful how you use cannabis if you have a family history of psychosis or if you have a history of psychosis yourself. People with cardiovascular disease, be careful how you use cannabis. Cannabis is a vasodilator. It will drop your blood pressure. It will raise your heart rate. In fact, that is why your eyes look red when you, when you use cannabis because your, your, your vessels dilate. Um, be, be aware if you have a, 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 a weak heart, um, and that hypertensive episode may trigger an event. Don't mix, as we've said. And synthetic recreational cannabinoids, K2 and spice and products like that. We are saying these products should not be brought on the market. And the other area that we have to be careful with the regulation is vaping and the vaping products, which, have been, which in some cases have been severely acute with acute lung injury. Thank you very much. Thank you so much there, Dr. King. Very, very, very uh, intriguing uh, report that you've just presented, and I do hope that we'll have the questions coming in based on the health factors. We want to move quickly on to Mrs. Melissa Hippolyt-Descart, who is the economic consultant of the Sinusha Cannabis Commission, and she, of course, will be putting into perspective the dollars and cents where this is concerned. It's all yours. Thank you, moderator. So Dr. King has spoken about the health effects of cannabis, and the Cannabis Commission contracted me to provide an objective economic analysis 
of the regulation of the cannabis industry in St. Lucia. And one of the things I love about economics is it's very, it's not open to interpretation, it's not subjective. We measure and we provide data and we are advocates for evidence-based policy making. Now, before I go into the economic assessment, I know my colleagues have already alluded to some of the, the points we want to make, but I understand that not everybody has the context and the background. So I will briefly just go around and just present some of the um, background to the entire um, legislative um, framework and the movement towards reform. So when we talk about cannabis, sometimes we, and, and when you look at it, some persons, especially people that are 60 and above, they, sometimes we don't remember a time before cannabis was illegal. But cannabis was not always illegal. Prior to the 1960s, as Dr. King spoke about, cannabis was first used for medical and religious purposes. Then we saw an evolution in terms of industrial use in soap, in fiber production, in lamp fuel. And it was in the 1960s when cannabis became popular in the Western world, we saw that shift towards prohibition and criminalization. And interestingly, around that same time, we saw movements in the alcohol industry where alcohol was, become, it was legalized and we found that there were lobbies that would lobby the government because cannabis was perceived as a threat to that burden industry, which was why they moved towards the criminalization of cannabis based on unsubstantiated associations with criminality and the perceived harmful effects. Now, what gave, what gave um, the legal framework for the current prohibition and criminalization that we see in the member states is that at the UN level, several, um, several conventions were passed. We saw one being passed in 1961, which was the UN Single Convention on Narcot Narcotic Drugs. Then we had another one passed in 1971, and the third <coughs> one was passed in 1998. Now, together, all of these conventions, because they, they didn't happen one time, first of all, there was the prohibition, then the criminalization mm -hmm. of different elements. But together, they serve to now uh, make illegal not just the possession of cannabis, the production of cannabis, also the, the trade of cannabis. Now, this has very important um, implications because if you're looking at building an industry, if you have a legislative framework that makes it illegal not just to possess, but also to, to, to produce or trade in cannabis, we could see why um, the, there is a need towards cannabis reform if we need to benefit from um, having a cannabis industry. But what is interesting, and, and like Dr. King spoke about, the Western world has spent millions on the war against drugs, but has this been effective? So despite this legal framework for prohibition and criminalization, we see the data shows, according to the World Drug Report of 2019, cannabis is still the most commonly used illicit drug. And with 3.8% of the global population, which is roughly about 188 million people between the ages of 15 to 64 reported using cannabis at least once in 2017. And we saw that for the period 1998 to 2017, the overall number of cannabis users worldwide increased by 30%. And right here in St. Lucia, Dr. King showed the, um, the data on cannabis use among secondary, um, secondary school students. So this provides evidence that despite prohibition, cannabis is still being used. So when we, when we, if we were asked to ask ourselves a critical question, if we're going to spend so much money or the cost of enforcement is so high, if we can curb or we can prevent the use, it tells us that we need to go back to the drawing board to see whether our policies are effective at meeting our objectives. So based on all of that, and also with a lot of the, the literature that Dr. King spoke about with the, the, the medical benefits of cannabis, we see a shift in perception worldwide. While countries are now doing away with the criminalization and the prohibition legal framework, and moving towards more a regulatory framework. So the data showed that to date, about 35 countries, including some of our own Caribbean countries, such as Jamaica, Antigua, St. Kitts and Nevis, most of these countries are moving toward the, towards either one, decriminalization of cannabis, or two, legalizing cannabis for medical and non-medical use. 
Now, in, the, in, the, um, in 2013, in December, Uruguay became the first country to legalize cannabis for non-medical use, which was followed by Canada in October 2018. Now, while the U.S. as a, a country has not legalized cannabis, we saw movement in several states where 11 states in the U.S. have legalized the non-medical use of cannabis, whereas 33 states have legalized it for medical use. So in the Caribbean, we realize what is happening in the global environment. And at the CARICOM level, like um, the, um, as um, Mr. Gordon spoke about, a CARICOM regional commission was appointed in 2014 with the mandate to explore the social, economic, health, and legal implications of cannabis use in the Caribbean. And we spoke about some of the recommendations of the commission's 2018 report we spoke to members moving towards a new regulatory framework for cannabis that balances not just the economic benefits, but also the public health and the social concerns, which takes us where we are today in St. Lucia with our own Cannabis Commission, which was appointed with a similar mandate in July of 2019. So with the arguments, so we know that the legalization or even the regulation of cannabis is a very sensitive issue and it's very controversial and a lot of the controversy centers around some of the perceived health effects and Dr. King spoke about it because we know that um, there's psychotic effects, there's a high risk of dependence, there's antisocial behavior especially in children and teens. However, when we look at um, the, other, um, the other side of the, um, the coin, we see that there's also medical properties of cannabis. Now, an interesting argument is that if we look at, we say that um, cannabis should be prohibited because of the high risk of dependence and impairment, we see that there's a similar incidence of impairment and dependence in alcohol use. However, alcohol is not illegal. Alcohol is regulated. So the, it begs the question, why doesn't cannabis give, be given a similar treatment? Now, I'm not going to go into all of the medical um, data because that has already been done, but what I want to, to, to stress upon is the greater socioeconomic benefits with regards to value added, employment, government revenue, compared to the cost of the status quo with regards to our enforcement costs and the high rates of incarceration of our youth. So I'm going to go into this next section, and some of what I'm going to present has already been presented, so I'm just going to just slide through it. And we saw this legal framework, Dr. King presented it, but I'm just going to put it on again to state that if we want to explore the uh, cannabis industry or explore building a cannabis industry in St. Lucia, the first thing we need to look at is a change in the legal framework. Because on our books currently, it is illegal to import cannabis, export it, supply it, produce it, cultivate it. Mm -hmm. So this itself means that you have no basis for an industry if your legal framework has not been revised. Now, what does the enforcement framework look like in St. Lucia? We have different agencies responsible for different things. So it starts with the police who are responsible for investigation arrests. We have some sort of forensics. I'm not quite sure how much it is, but it's supposed to be um, used for evidence testing then the courts for prosecution and sentences and if um, incarceration if you sentence or if you want remand now dr king um so showed this um data in a, in a in a different way but what i, I like graphs graphs shows you like the pattern so we realize in the last five years the cannabis related crimes reported and it's interesting to say reported has increased by 140 percent from 167 crimes in 2014 to 401 crimes reported in 2018. However, if you could look at the slide, when we look at the number of persons arrested, we realize it's on a declining trend, which supports what Dr. King alluded to with regards to law enforcement, whether they, they still want to criminalize that aspect of um, cannabis or is it right to arrest persons for the possession. And this slide even makes it even clearer. So if we're looking at cannabis-related offenses by the type of offense, we see that unlawful possession of cannabis is about 61%. It accounts for 61% of the 
of those cannabis-related crimes. So that's the young persons on the street with, with, that are caught with a joint or they're caught in possession of any quantities of marijuana. This makes up the large amount of the persons that are typically arrested for cannabis-related offenses. This slide was also presented in terms of the, the, the number of cannabis-related crime to total crime, but I just want to just add another element to it. So when we look at the number of cannabis-related crimes as a percentage of total crimes, we see on average for the five-year period is about 1%. However, it makes up 10% of the arrests, right? So this, it, it tells you that there's a disproportionate amount of arrests for cannabis-related crimes as it relates to total crimes. And it's very interesting to see that in 2018 that it went down because in the, in the, the previous years, we could see that disproportionate, um, the disproportionate trend happening. Now, even more interestingly is the, the graph, the, the, second, the second chart that shows total crimes cleared versus cannabis crimes cleared. And when we look at it, we could see that roughly about 86% of cannabis crimes are cleared. And what does that mean? It means that these crimes have been investigated and they've been resolved in some manner, whether the persons have been arrested, whether it's been dismissed, but police resources have been allocated towards investigating these crimes. However, with regards to total crimes, we see only on average 54% of total crimes being cleared. And that, that seems to suggest that the resources that we could have been, um, we could have been spending on you know, clearing more serious crimes like murder and, and some of the other crimes, these resources are, these resources are being diverted towards cannabis-related crimes. So with a reallocation, if cannabis were to be made regulated rather than um, illegal, we could see a reallocation of these resources to resolve some of the serious crimes. Okay, so if we go further, Quite apart from the arrest, now we go towards the cannabis-related incarceration. And Dr. King spoke about that. Roughly about 7% of our um, inmates are in custody because of cannabis-related offenses. And that represents roughly about 39 persons. And that data is as of October 2019. Now, it may not seem as a lot, but when you have um, a prison who is a, that's already close to capacity, out of that 39 persons, seven of them have been sentenced, while 32 percent, sorry, 32 of them are on remand awaiting trial. So persons, 32 percent, 32 um, prisoners have to be fed, have to be housed, awaiting trial, on remand for a cannabis-related offense. When we look at the age distribution of persons that are admitted for cannabis-related offenses, we see the majority fall between the youth years. So roughly between 20 to around 35 percent. And Dr. King spoke about it. That this has very serious social implications because if you have a large percentage of your youth population in, in, in prison, this affects their future prospects for employment, they're stigmatized, and this is what we need to start talking about when we talk about issues of poverty and issues of crime, because some of these um, kids without proper prospect in the formal economy, they find themselves in the informal economy. So it's very interesting that sometimes we don't marry our policies. We talk about, we look at poverty in one aspect. We look at family structure breakdown in one aspect. However, we have a policy on the books that now incarcerate a lot of our marginalized youth and put them in prison just for possession of cannabis. Let's just delve even deeper, and I wanted to provide a slide on just the educational and occupational profile of these um, prisoners admitted for cannabis, and we see most of them would have secondary and primary education, and some of them maybe about tertiary and, and university. However, some of, a lot of them would be either farmers, construction workers, mechanics, ca carpenters, and that's just, that's just to say that these people could be out there earning a living, contributing to, to, to the, um, providing employment for their families, sorry, providing for their families, however, now they're in prison. So if we speak about all of these things, it does create, um, you know, space for the discussion about what can we do if we realize the current framework is not effective, what are some of the alternative regulatory models we can explore? 
So in the analysis, there are several, I guess, permutations, but you need to start somewhere. And then we decided to look at three of them, criminalization and two variations of full legalization. Under full legalization, one of them is on the competitive markets and the other one is state control. With decriminalization, what happens is that a small amount of cannabis for personal use is no longer considered a criminal offense. However, cannabis is still illegal for sale, for production and possession of more than the minimum amount. With the full legalization, possession, production and sale is fully legalized. However, the difference between state control and competitive market control comes with regards to the pricing. So under competitive markets, the price is determined by the market, just like regular goods and services. However, under state control, just like government has control over cement and flour, they would have a price on cannabis. So we had some examples of um, some of the, the frameworks that existed in other countries. So examples of criminalization, is we have Jamaica, we have Antigua. But what's interesting is that in these frameworks, not because there's illegalizations and some people seem to um, mistake that um, regulation would mean a free for all. No, we would still have different um, criteria as minimum age, the personal quantity possession, all of these things would have to be spelled out and the number of plants for home cultivation. So in Jamaica, we see that the minimum age is roughly about 18 years, and Jamaica has a higher personal possession quantity than most of the other countries at 56.6 grams. Then when we look at full legalization, some examples of that is Colorado, Washington State, California, most of the US based states are usually on the competitive market and similarly they would have a minimum age however in the u.s it's roughly 21 compared to the caribbean where it's about 18 and their personal quantity is about 28.5 grams however the average retail price which is a very um, interesting element with competitive market is that the price would vary across states so in california it would be roughly about 21 dollars whereas we'll see about 11 dollars in in Washington state. And Canada and Uruguay would be examples of the state control. So let's go into the economic assessment now. So if we need to do a cost benefit analysis of the different models, the first thing you would need to do is to make assumptions about what type of framework you would want to implement this on. And um, Mr. Gordon spoke about some of the framework that we, we, we looked at. and. I'm presenting two of them here, criminalization, decriminalization and legalization. So similarly, we would have a minimum age, which is about 18 years, the personal possession quantity, roughly about 30 grams, home cultivation, roughly about six plants. There would be a fine on the decriminalization. However, under legalization, there will be no fine and so many other elements. So if the government needs to implement a regulatory framework, they would need to um, come up with answers to some of these other um, these, these parts of the framework. So, for example, the retail pricing structure, the transaction limit, the average price per gram, the maximum TST content, and we would assume that you know there would be prohibitions on public smoking, drug driving, advertising, and some sort of a tax um, system would have to be considered. So just to put in perspective some of the implementation design that um, Mr. Gordon spoke about, just to see it on screen, we had three options. So these would be the implementation design frameworks if we were to legalize cannabis. The first option would be on the competitive market. And we have two options or two variations of the state control. One would be fully state and one would be quasi state. Now the differences between this would be about how you would set up your regulatory authority. So under the competitive market, the suggestion would be that nothing really changes and cannabis would be regulated within a related ministry, similarly to how alcohol licenses are issued. And that uh, ministry would be responsible for enforcing the regulations and tax would be administered similarly under the Inland Revenue Department. However, under the state control and the quasi-state, the recommendation is to have a, a statutory body which would, one, regulate all industry activities, issue the industry guidelines, enforce the regulation, collects the taxes. 
But the difference between the quasi-state and the state is that one, the, um, qua the state would now operate the, op um, the cooperative, whereas under competitive market, under quasi-state, the cooperative would be owned. It would be a private company partly owned by the farmers, and it would be, it would be licensed to sell to wholesalers and manufacturers of re um, retailers. The prices under the competitive market would be derived by the market. However, under the state control, it would be fixed by the statutory board. So this is just um, an example just to show pictorially like how it would work. So in the legalization competitive market, the government is pretty much on the outside. So the farmers will cultivate, sell to the cooperative, and the cooperative will sell to the manufacturer and the producers and to the retailers. In the state control, we see that the statutory body has more power in that the farmers sell to them and the statutory body will be the one responsible for regulation and distribution. Whereas in the hybrid, which is the quasi-state, you still have the cannabis um, body regulating. However, the farmers sell to the cooperative and the cooperative sells now to the manufacturers. So I'm going to present some numbers below on this slide, which is the implementation design and assumption just gives the basis assumptions as to where we got some of those numbers. So the assumption is that local farmers will cultivate roughly about 2,000 acres with a ratio of roughly one farmer per acre. Now, this is in no way indicative of what the government will um, decide. However, you cannot measure if you don't make assumptions. So some assumptions have to be made. So if we say that roughly one acre produces 360 pounds of clean and dry cannabis, and the manufacturer would purchase this at roughly about 205 EC dollars to produce CBD oil for export, and would have retailers selling to the domestic consumers and tourist visitors. The proposed tax rates, so we, um, the assumption is that several taxes would be implemented at different levels. So we'd have a farm gate, farm gate tax, which is roughly about $50 per kilogram, would be placed on the farmers. Then the manufacturer would be paying a corporate tax rate of roughly 30% of profits. Then persons that are employed, because one of the interesting things about having the industry is that you'd have employment, and the government will now benefit from additional in personal income tax from those persons um, getting a job and um, the licenses would be paid by the cooperative. So the cooperative will not be paying taxes. However, because under our cooperative act, um, cooperatives are non-profits. However, they will be subject to an annual license fee of roughly about $2,000 per annum, and this is subjective. And the farmer will also now be licensed at roughly about $500 per acre. Then there'll be an excise tax on the CBD oil, and the government can choose between whether they want a VAT or if they want a cannabis sales tax or if they want both. So they would have to consider that based on um, the pricing because you'd want to have a price that would not lead to, you know, the price being higher than the black market. And then persons, you know, still go to the black market, which negates what you're trying to achieve. So when we look at the methodology, um, we use a cost benefit analysis to assess the three frameworks. And these are not exhaustive, but it was based on the available data. So some of the costs we looked at was fiscal costs, which is including um, enforcement costs of your police, your prisons, implementation costs, the social um, costs, which is the health and treatment costs of um, the mental health costs, the economic, which is roughly the employment, the wage loss due to incarceration. And under the benefits, we see government revenue in taxes, licenses, fees, and fines, increase in employment and wages and value added. So when we look at the enforcement costs, um, we look at police detection costs, court-related costs, forensic costs, prison costs, and the details of this would, would be in the report in terms of where the data was found. Under the decriminalization model or what happens right now, we realize that we pay roughly $2.4 million every year just to enforce the current regime. However, if we were to decriminalize marijuana, which is not legalization, so there'll be no industry, there will still be some element of enforcement, but the cost goes down to roughly 1.9 million. And under model two and three, which are the legalization models, the cost is significantly lower, which is just a little bit above half a million dollars. When we look at the revenue, 
under the and so there will be no revenue under the under model one because decriminalization there will be no industry but under model two and three we see that there's a roughly about 82 million dollars that can be generated with um, model two and roughly about 80 under model three so both of these models will yield significant amount of revenues for the government the differences is um, the differences we saw was based on the implementation cost so if you have uh, model three where you have a statutory body there will be more implementation costs which would um, account for the difference when we look at value added and i'm not going to go into all of the methodology but value added is how we measure gdp the contribution to gdp so when you look at the value of output you minus the cost of inputs and taxes what is left is the value added and we saw that the value added on the model two is roughly about 426 million dollars which is very significant and especially in a time of covid um, the, the, the economy can definitely do with that boost so just to provide a summary of the results. So when we looked at all of the different costs, all of the different benefits, we had to now weigh the models and evaluate them based on the net benefits or the net costs. So the current model, which is model zero, which is prohibition of um, cannabis, we left with a negative number, which is a cost of roughly 3.6 million. Model one is a little slightly better, which is decriminalization. However, there is still a cost without any additional benefits of roughly two million. However, if we were to go the route of legalization under model two and three, we see that there is an, an excess of roughly about $550 million under those models. So just to summarize everything in an economic impact summary, we wanted to look at what would be the benefits to GDP unemployment, the fiscal balance, and the external trade balance. So based on the figures for GDP at 2018 prices, we saw that the economy was roughly about $4.4 billion um, with regards to GDP. Now if we were to add the value added from the cannabis industry of the $426 million, the increase in gross value added would be roughly about 10%. Now compare that to all of the, 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 the um, declines. On average, the economy of St. Lucia grows roughly about one, maybe if we're in a good year, 3%. We've not had 3% in a very long time. So roughly about 2%. So just the value added from that industry can give you a bump of roughly about 10% increase in your GDP. When we look at unemployment, the rate as at, at, at 2018 was roughly about 20.2%. If we were to increase um, employment through the cannabis industry, the rate would now reduce to roughly about 18.2%. Now, we heard the Prime Minister, um, through the, um, especially in the budget, speaks about, he speaks about the fiscal balance, and that is the balance of what your revenue is minus your expenditure. Right now, our fiscal balance, as of 2018, was roughly 1.1, it was a deficit of 1.1% of GDP. However, with the additional revenues from cannabis, we could see that we would move from a deficit into a fiscal surplus of roughly 0.5%. And the trade balance, we know that the Caribbean countries, most of the time we experience a negative trade balance because our exports are always lower than our imports of roughly about 27.4%. However, if we were to export the, the CBD oil and some of the other cannabis related products, we could see that it would go down by roughly 10 percentage points to 17%. So in summary, while we understand that there are um, health effects to cannabis, we need to ask ourselves, and I think it's a very important juncture to ask whether the existing policies, whether they're effective at meeting our objective because we still see an increase in incidence, and can we now balance this off with the economic benefits where we can generate employment, have a higher GDP, have higher revenues, where we can now funnel this money into some of the more important objectives of government with increased public health, increased social spending, and to um, boost the economy of St. Lucia. So I thank you, and I'm open for any questions. 
Thank you so much there, Mrs. Melissa Hippoly Descant, who's the economic consultant, the Senusha Cannabis Commission. And yes, the questions have been coming in. We want to say at this point hello to Andrew DeCaris because uh, the Senusha Cannabis Movement has been at the forefront of this for a number of years. It's been a very long road. Having heard the presentations, and of course you've been involved in uh, the, the work of the commission over the last year, for you, is this comforting that Senusha seems to finally be carving out a path for itself where the use of cannabis is concerned? Um, definitely. Um, I mean, when you have a presentation, presentations like these, um, it, it's gratifying that, that typically conservative minds are using science to decide and formulate opinions, um, positive uh, opinions at that. Uh, I mean, it, the, the, the history, all the information was there. And I think a lot of people formed negative opinions because they were furnished with a lot of propaganda and misinformation. So if you, you, you can't formulate a, a, an informed opinion on lies and propaganda. Now the science is there for everybody to see. Um, that forensic economic uh, presentation would, you know, I, I think more people are going to realize the benefits and that we can use monies to deal with the negative effects of cannabis. So I'm thrilled to be part of this. I'm the minnow in the pond here, as you, 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 you can see, and um, I'm thrilled to be with this team. Um, I must give kudos to Invest St. Lucia, the Secretariat, and everybody involved in the commission, um, all the members. We put our heads together, and we've come up with, a, I think, a, a, a document that could be a template for small island developing states with intentions of, of, of changing their laws. I think we would be the, the premier template. All right, stay with us because we are going to post some of those questions posted and you can feel free to chime in at any point. Um, we have a question here. Cannabis um, to be, will it be grown only under the license regime? And does that mean a Rastafarian or someone growing for personal use um, unlicensed will be facing penalties. We do provide in the report a specific section dealing with Rastafarians. Uh, we also provide in the report that one of the things we recommend is that persons be allowed to grow a certain maximum number of plants within their own home environment. But the Rastafarians have to be regarded as a separate problem. Not problem, a separate uh, issue to be dealt with. What is the regulatory model being proposed by the Commission? Fundamentally, the regulatory model is that there be, as I stated earlier, there be a cooperative which would comprise all the growers and it is that cooperative which would license new mm -hmm. growers. It is that cooperative that would purchase all of the produced marijuana other than that produced by the Rastafarians or persons within their domestic environment. And it is that cooperative which would sell to the persons for personal use and or and for medicinal and industrial use. And um, Lisa, if yes. I can just add something mm -hmm. on this too. Um, the cooperative model is so important and Mr. Gordon has mentioned it, but I want people to also understand how important it is to have small farmers in a collective such that they can have the capital power to invest in the agribusiness and the value added um, products of cannabis. So for instance, the extraction um, facilities and the pharmaceutical factories that can be, that can be, pre that are part of the cannabis industry. Um, it is important that we bring that cooperative together so that we, we wanted to have a model that is a wealth um, generating model for the small farmers as opposed to uh, uh, an extraction type model where you know we are just raw, we are producers of raw material, mm -hmm. and um, foreigners or other people, um, big capitalists benefit. So it's, it's a it's primarily a pro 
small farmer pro poor model for in the cannabis industry. And I, um, we were at pains at the, um, with the commission discussions that I was involved in. For, for, uh, I heard that. And that is something we recommended very strongly to government to not move away from that model. Okay. So under this um, regulatory framework, will we be seeing the prohibition of the importation of cannabis for local use and for sale as well? Uh, importation is not something we have dealt with, rather the opposite. But um, in my estimation, yes, importation would be made illegal. Okay. What would be the overall cost of licensing to a cannabis farmer, Ms. Descant? Do you want to oh. speak to that? And as well, as while we're on it, um, the sort of to quantify for us on an annual basis the, the sort of revenue uh, you would propose that they contribute to earn from the cannabis. Okay, so just going back to um, one of my slides, for the farmer, the license fee is roughly, um, well, my estimates were based on a license fee of roughly $500 per year, per annum. And the revenues we saw um, are roughly um, between $82.2 million and $80 million under the different models. So how will the informal um, industry that we have going on now be brought into this regulatory, um, regulated environment? I would leave that to Mr. DeCarius. Um Right now, we have many people, more than a thousand people who sell, grow. Um, there's an underground industry that's worth probably about between 45 and $50 million. And how we came up with that, if 20% of the people spend five dollars a day on cannabis um, that's 34,000 people spending five it's close to 45 million dollars a year so right now as it's illegal there's this this industry that is contributing to people's livelihoods and many people send their kids to school w with that money and buy just live on that money and what we don't want to do is to, to get into a legalized regime and those people who have been or are in it get marginalized. So what we want to do is basically turn a criminal into a legitimate business person. So everybody who is selling on the block or uh, growing would join the cooperative, get licensed, obviously training, mm -hmm. because there'd be a new way to sell. You wouldn't have to be by a corner, sticking it in a bucket underneath some bush somewhere. Because of the regulatory requirements, you'd, you'd be required to display your cannabis. It would be weighed. Uh, and, and that's where all the regulations come into place. So the people who are involved right now, we want them to benefit economically first. And then people behind them come into the industry. Right. So we have another question coming in here. Will a value-added business model like an edible based uh, business using cannabis need to be licensed or will farmers solely need to be licensed? My own view is that such an industry would need to be licensed. End use must be licensed, in my opinion, simply so that there can be control. I don't know if I anybody yes. else yeah, agree. feels the, the same. All agreed. All agreed. All right, wonderful. Uh, does a distinctive St. Lucian strain of cannabis currently exist? No. Um, having, I've, over the years I've been privileged to meet many people in the cannabis industry worldwide and many of them uh, have encouraged us to develop, it's called a, a, a land-based strain, like for instance um, many people may have heard of the Jamaica lamb's bread mm -hmm. and the Hawaiian Maui Waui. These are, uh, 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 and the, the um, Colombian gold. These are strains that have been grown there for years over and over again. And as a result, they, they, they're typically named and they have a certain flavor percentage THC. What has happened with us is that we have been, we just use any seeds we can get. Our farmers just use any seeds we can get for, for years. And I would say it's only within the last five years um, since other countries have been uh, relaxing their laws that uh, they have actual people who produce seeds with certain CBD to THC ratios and now some of our farmers are getting their hands on that. So there are foreign seeds that we grow in here and 
with legalization, we will have a research license and we'd be able to develop our own land, land race trains. So no, we don't have like a Grace Goal or Piton Red or no, we don't, we don't have those trains as yet. So what are we taking to the market? What, once we, if we're able to go this way, what are we taking to the market to draw all of this uh, economic benefits to St. Lucia? Most of that that Ms. Hippolyte Descartes um, was based on the medical, the 2,000 acres of medical cannabis. So um, the medical cannabis industry can take thousands of tons mm. to be turned into to, to CBD oil that then you add value by making pharmaceuticals out of it. So a lot of that is based on that model. It would be hard if somebody grows 50,000 pounds of high-grade THC. Where would we sell it? And at this point in time, the world market, there, there's not much. Um, like we export piton, and you can get piton in America. At this point in time, we can't really export our cannabis anywhere yet because the international cannabis markets haven't been developed to that state as yet. So the, the big money would be right now for for farmers in the medical cannabis industry. Just to, just to add to that, um, so the way the model would work, um, so if the farmers were to produce or to cultivate the cannabis, they would earn roughly um, an income of roughly about $65,000 a year, which is equivalent to about five, roughly $5,400. However, um, the value added we see is in the CBD oil, like um, um, Andre said. And when we did the research on average, um, a liter of CDB oil goes for roughly 150 US dollars, which is roughly about 405 EC dollars. So there's a, um, there's a huge market for CBD oil, and it's very expensive, and that's where most of the value added will be generated. Dr. King, you wanted to chime in? Yeah, two things. Um, one is that, you know, a lot of people there might be saying, yeah, but, you know, as the market, as other countries come into this, the price of CBD oil might drop under, mm -hmm. under, under production. And that's why one of the models, or one of the things we were keen on, is putting more value added in St. Lucia, including pharmaceutical factories. So because what will happen is that if we are, if we, we are then converting our own oil into our own pharmaceuticals, the price of pharmaceuticals tends not to be um, as um, fickle as the price of, a, of, a, of, a, of an intermediate product such as CBD oil. It's not a raw product, but it's an intermediate product. So that's one of the reasons why we want a model that we can invest in all the value added so that we can have a far more sustainable cannabis industry. So we're not just depending on the price of CBD oil extracts on the global market. We can actually produce our own pharmaceuticals as well. And the other thing is that talking, there's a very interesting paper that came out last year on the cannabis experience, a scientific study done on the experience, personal experience of recreational cannabis. Because traditionally, we have said that high THC gives you a better experience than low THC, generally speaking. This, this paper is saying that's not so. The entourage effect gives you a different effect. So actually, cannabis strains are a lot like wine. And it is not straight measured THC. 15% THC is, gives you a better high than a 10% THC. It's all the other chemicals in it. And when we do our research over in the, in the recreational personal use market, you're now talking about the boutique type of market, especially if you're talking about cannabis tourism. So in that research, we're going to have to be finding out strains that grow, for instance, in the Francais Jacques volcanic um, soils in, in, in certain cool environments that may produce a particular high-grade, not necessarily high THC, but high-grade experience um, cannabis um, product that we can then use as a niche marketing. That's the kind of thinking we would have in the two arms of the industry, the medical arm and the, 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 the sort of the, the boutique um, experience arm. If okay. I might just add to that, a fundamental in our thinking in choosing the cooperative was to be able to get the local farmer combined in a body capable of investing in the intermediate and ultimately the final product. That, to us, was crucial. Okay. We have another medical question coming in here. Dr. King, 
uh, what provisions uh, are in place for the use of cannabis who may suffer from drug-induced psychosis? You know, you, we spoke a lot, you spoke a lot about that earlier on. Yes, so I in did. terms of that support and that safety net for the society. Well, that, that question, look at the current situation. The truth is our mental health services are not at the level that they should be. Um, we have current mental health services and we all know what they are. Right? Mm -hmm. And that is what's, what we are currently using for anybody with a psychosis, including a cannabis-induced um, um, psychosis. Um, what we are proposing under a legal regime is a couple of things. One, good education, good family support, good medical support, and better mental health services. I think mm -hmm. mental health services, when we did the health financing, the last time I was involved in health research and we did health financing, we found that we were so behind the eight ball. So low, our investment in mental health services in Sanusha is way behind what it should be. Um, the cannabis industry gives us an opportunity to invest, and I'm talking about in holistic mental health services. So we're talking about prevention of problems, we're talking about the early identification of problems, and the, the, the targeted personal um, strategy, because each person we may have a different set of supports, a different strategy, and a different set of reasons as to why they are they're having a particular problem with a particular substance, such as cannabis. So we are saying that if we have more revenues, we can then invest in, in, in these services and therefore create a much better environment for people who suffer the consequences of cannabis-induced mental health issues, um, including psychosis. Um, I foresee I foresee um, um, mental health services not just confined to the National Mental Wellness Center. The, de the decentralized model of mental health, community mental health services, we can invest in that with mental health teams in communities so that you can actually handle um, people that may have a, 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 a psychotic episode, not so much as sending them to Kubaril, but, keep, but having them close to home where you can have the, 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 the family support and community support. And, that, and that's where we have to go. And that's why we're talking here today. Because, in fact, we want communities to understand mental health, particularly, as you, as you raise it here, and to actually embrace the fact that mental health is, not, is just another illness that needs to be handled with clear strategies that we know that we know. We just need to invest in them and put them in place. All right. We're fast running out of time, but there are two other questions here. What is the less harmful way of consuming cannabis? <laughs> um, maybe, uh, Andre, used to go on that one first, <laughs> and I'll come after. Um, cannabis is a very diverse uh, substance, and like we said, these, as Dr. King said, the CBD to THC ratios could influence the, 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 the effect on the humor, on, on the person. Um, and then there are the tolerance levels of the individual themselves. Um, sometimes with one strain, one person, just like alcohol, can take two drawers on it and attain a certain um, sensation, a buzz. buzz, and is <laughs> happy with that. And they have other people that would use that same cannabis and smoke a whole spliff and not attain that buzz. So, um, so in terms of s smoking, um, I would say anybody who's, who's initiating and we're not promoting smoking we know that smoking is not good we're not promoting advertising but if some because in one of our um, consultations around the country a young lady said well i don't smoke but if it's going to be legal i sure would like to try it how do i try it and that was a question that you remember that yes i do yeah uh, it's a hard question to answer because she said well i uh, now it's legal i want to try it so how do you educate people as how to initiate themselves in cannabis? And I would say, take one pull and don't take more than one pull and wait for the effect. Wait 20 minutes. If you're going to, if you're going to eat it, be very careful. Take a small amount and wait an hour. And that, that's it. So it depends on the metabolism of the person, their tolerance levels. As Dr. King said, you know, if you have genetically predisposed, not good. Then don't don't want, yes. There are so many ways. So, for instance, you know, smoking. Okay, you release the THC. THC is, a, is, a, is in in the cannabis plant is 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 form of THCA. You need to actually heat it or burn it to release THC. 
Because THCA, which is a carboxylated THC, doesn't have any psychoactive effect. It's THC when you decarboxylate it that has the effect. And it, that happens with burning or exposure to light. So when you, when you light it and you burn it, you, 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 will re, you get THC. But you get smoke coming down as well. That smoke is irritant. And I remember I mentioned about not mixing it with tobacco, just to remind people on that. Vaping. So when you, when you burn, you have a high um, temperature and you have a lot of, of smoke product of all different kinds. And smoke will have 500 plus chemicals in it in addition to the cannabinoids. Vaping, as you'd appreciate, is a much lower temperature and you can actually, the, 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 the oil that you're going to vape with could actually um, only give you the cannabis or the cannabinoids you're looking for or the extract from the plant, if you're doing it in a holistic way, not, and not without all the other um, chemicals. So you'd say that vaping might be less dangerous than smoking the, the, burn, the burning spliff, right? Then you could have like the Rastafarians when you, when you take it through the water and, and, and stuff. So you could, they, uh, however, however um, I, uh, Pancho can tell you more about that than me, right? But again, you, that's another way of, 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 of reducing maybe the, the ill effects of smoking. In terms of oil, because you can have oil, which can have THC. You can put oil in, in, in your, your food. You could put oil in your, in your tea. You could put oil, well, you could, you could put drops of oil in your, in your mouth, in your tongue, under your tongue, etc. You could have sprays that you could use, you know. Um, so there are a whole, you can put it in your food, your, your brownies, your cakes, your salads. So there are different ways. But remember, if you don't heat it, and you take a raw plant and you don't heat it, you're not going to get any psychoactive effects. Many of the oils, um, and again, Andre can tell you more about those oils and how they produce them, but some of those oils are produced through a heating process. So the oils have already liberated the THC in the oil. All right. I want to thank you so much. We have so uh, used up all of our time and even over time. We want to thank you for all of this information. And I do hope that Senusians to have a better sense of what the work of the commission has been in the last year, the now draft report that the commission has and that the government is going to be guided by in order for a definitive decision to be made on the cannabis industry in St. Lucia. So you've been tuned into the Cannabis Reform, a balanced perspective and national consultation. We want to say thank you very much to the chairman of the St. Lucia Cannabis Commission, Mr. Michael Gordon QC, Dr. Stephen King, who is a consultant, this, uh, St. Lucia Cannabis Commission, the health consultant, and Mrs. Melissa Hippolyte Descartes, the economic consultant to the St. Lucia Cannabis Commission, as well as Mr. Andre DeCaris, who is the St. Lucia Cannabis Movement President and member of the St. Lucia Cannabis Commission. We also want to say thank you to Mr. Dylan Norbert Inglis, the legal officer within the Ministry of Commerce, as well as Ms. Venita Thomas, the legal officer at Invest St. Lucia. I am Mr. Joseph saying thank you so much for watching. Until next time.